chance we were both the same We tried to reach the sun but we flew too high We never became one never wondered why I hear your voice and it's calling out
coming from out of the sky Mass extinction Forces are rising to stand up and fight Welcome to a very special Let's Play presented by Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, which is available October 26th on PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Xbox Series S, Series S, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, and PC. Whew. And it's special for a couple of reasons, because the kind folks over at Square Enix, Marvel Games, and Eidos Montreal have agreed to let us stream Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy a day before release, and they were kind enough to supply us with some Guardians of our own. Now, joining me to check it out is Senior Creative Director on Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, Jean-Francois Dugas, and Mary DeMarle, who is the Senior Narrative Director. Welcome! And we are, uh, we are in the far reaches of space. This is Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, JF, why don't you just... First things first, what is Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, the video game, aside from everything I just said? Well, in a nutshell, it's a third-person action adventure in which you play uh, Peter Quill, the so-called leader of the Guardians, and you will uh, guide them through a big journey across the galaxy uh, to, to save the day, and you're going to use the powers of your Guardians along the way. So it's a very narratively, uh, narratively driven experience that will, will, will take you on a very, very exciting uh, adventure. Now, we just saw a little dialogue box there. Um, as we can see, we are we are just controlling Star-Lord. Can you Correct. talk a little bit about the choice to make this a game where you just control Star-Lord and kind of, you know, I guess, uh, delegate among the other members versus just a game where you control everyone? Absolutely. Uh, one of the first things we wanted with this game was to break expectations and be able to leverage the power of the Guardians franchise. And when you look at those characters, they're very colorful, they're very eclectic and everything. And all of what they do, it's being in relationship with each other, like fighting, agreeing, coming up with plans and things like that. And they're constantly uh, together. And we thought like, you know what, that's the strength of the, the, the franchise. And it would be very powerful and very immersive and engaging to put you at the center of this team. So by being uh, Peter Quill is the so-called leader of the crew, like it puts you in the shoes of one of the guardians and you're surrounded by all of the rest of them and you're able to interact with them, to chip in conversation. Uh, you also have to make the calls for the team and also you will have to deal with the, the consequences that comes, uh, comes with that. So we thought that would be a very great way to engage audiences with a great uh, Guardians of the Galaxy experience. Now, a lot of people's first exposure to the Guardians was in the 2014 you know, MCU movie. Uh, yes. Kind of prior to that, they were, you know, kind of they're kind of some D-listers, you know. And I think there's there's definitely like a, it's it's funny because like I feel like when you you know you recast Spider-Man, it's been done a million times. There's less of kind of a like a, a knee-jerk reaction. But I think a lot of people are like why why isn't this Chris Pratt? Like how how are these Guardians different from the MCU versions? 
the, right from the get-go, when we sat with Marvel to discuss uh, where we would go with that project, uh, it was clear on their side, and it was our wish as well, to create something totally new, something really unique, like uh, Marvel wanted the Adas Montreal kind of touch, like what's your version of the Guardians of the Galaxy? So what we did is uh, we went on in creating this, this unique version, and the, 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 the challenge, or the, 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 I should say, the, uh, what we had to, to face as we were doing it, it was to, to come up with novelty, but at the same time, staying somewhat in the familiar territory. So people who know uh, of the MCU uh, and things like that, they would recognize those are the Guardians. But if you're new to the franchise, or even if you're an old fan, you'll see there's something different about those characters. And this is where it comes interesting, because it's not just uh, re-eating or re-chewing what has already been done and said. It's something really, really uh, different, a new story, a new background for the characters. Everything basically is new and Marvel like helped us and guide us to make sure we were creating an authentic version of the Guardians. There's something of a generational difference too. Like I, I feel like the you know the Chris Pratt MCU one is kind of a 70s kid, and this version of Peter Quill is very much like an 80s metalhead teenager. <laughs> I don't know where it's coming from. <laughs> I love it. It couldn't have anything to do with that Judas Priest shirt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, uh, let's be honest, it's a, it's a little bit inspired by our own youth and everything. And uh, in, uh, in our version of uh, The Guardians, uh, Peter Quill uh, is a kid, like he's a teenager uh, in the mid uh, 80s and is being influenced by the hard rock music. He has a soft spot for that, but he loves a lot of music, like he's, he's, he's really uh, embracing a lot of the, 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 the stuff from back then, video games and things like that, the movies. And we really wanted to, to capture that feel with uh, young Peter, but also with uh, the Peter that you play in the game as an adult. Uh, he has the Star-Lord patch in the back of his jacket, which is his favorite band, Star-Lord, that he brought from, from Earth when he was a kid. So uh, yes, there's a, a great 80 vibe uh, in there. It's great. Now, shifting gears, we can talk about music more a little bit, which I'm excited to do, but let's talk about the combat. This is this is clearly like very early in the game. We're still learning how to kick these little little guys. Yes. Well, it's uh, in this, it's really the beginning, like you said, the, the beginning of the game where we just uh, make you learn the, the, the fundamentals of combat and everything. And uh, it's a third person a shooter. Uh, if I say that in a simplistic way, because uh, at first you, you, you get the, the gist of like shooting, running around, uh, punching because you have melee abilities. Eventually you will have gadgets too. And as you progress through the first level, you'll get the guardians with you. And the guardians come with their own set of skills that you can uh, use during combat. And that's what you're going to learn uh, through the first chapter. So uh, combat is all about uh, maintaining the, the, the cohesion with the team, get, staying engaged in the fight like around your guardians. And the more you're engaged in the fight with them, the more they will be efficient. And as you use their abilities also, you're going to, to really maximize your opportunities against the enemies and you will fill your momentum bar. And the more you fill your momentum bar, now you have a perk that is called a huddle that you can call at any given time uh, to, to, to flip the, 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 the tables uh, during a fight if needed or if you just want to, to get on with something uh, more quickly. But uh, it's really a game about like, dealing with your character, but also maximizing and taking advantage of the powers that the Guardians have to offer. And the powers that they have aren't just used in combat. There's also kind of a, there's some like puzzle elements too here. Yes, you, you can, uh, as you progress through, uh, through different environments, there's traversal. Sometimes you will encounter puzzles in which you will have to use the skills of Gamora or Drax, Groot or, or Rocket and, and your own, uh, your own uh, powers as well. So it, it becomes very interesting because from almost start to finish, you constantly play with the Guardians, even though you just control one character, they're constantly around with you. Now, Mary, a minute ago, we saw a little sort of dialogue option of yes. do we want to, you know, do we want to uh, pitch a backup plan or want to have faith in this plan? And I think I said, what, did I say pitch a backup plan? I can't remember what it's Trust it, in it the didn't plan. Give me, yeah, it didn't give me any uh, any feedback. And I'm curious, like, are, what are the sort of cause and effect of, of choices in this? And will we, 
I guess are there are there sort of visible repercussions or is it kind of hidden? Well, there's a bunch of different repercussions. It really depends on what we're being presented with. Um, as you're walking through the game, you have those dialogue choices and they they can maybe just affect the flow of the conversation in that moment or potentially they could be a decision that affects gameplay later on. Um, so, for instance, you might be given a choice, which guardian are you going to depend on in a situation? And depending on how the guardians react to that, it can make the mission later on. You might have to play it a little differently because they might get mad at you. They might want to not help you at points. Um, and these choices can then play off on themselves very late into the game. Um, even affecting, you know, the final battle, who you have on your side um, as you as you confront the villains. And I would uh, I would add the thing is that even with some of the choices that are more about flavor, we track every single choice that players are making throughout the game under the hood, and it might have some sort of repercussion even beyond the credit roll. So it's a game that is really uh, rewarding until uh, the final moment of the game. So there's, I mean, there's definitely some proper role playing mechanics going on here, like as in the very literal sense of like you're you're Star Lord. Who yeah. do you who do you want to piss off or not piss off? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, the way I look at it is you're forming relationships for yourself with the team. Um, the story is linear, mostly. There's a central line, and certain events will always happen. Um, however, your experience of that story and your experience of your guardians depends on how you want to interact with them, how you want to talk to them. Do you find things in the environment you can give them later and that would open up uh, more information and form a, a, a closer relationship between you and the guardians? Now, JF, this is, uh, can you talk a little bit about sort of what the studio brings to Guardians, like because this is this is the Deus Ex team, correct? Correct. Well, is, uh, I feel like this is a, <laughs> kind of a far cry from what we're what we are used to. <laughs> yeah, we had to shift our brains from uh, one direction to the other direction totally. Uh, but definitely, we 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 brought uh, some of the aspects of uh, what we were doing in Deus Ex to Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy uh, when we think about choices and consequences. And as we were looking at the game we were making uh, with the franchise, you play as Star-Lord, the so-called leader, and it speaks uh, to choices and, and repercussions. So it's definitely something we wanted to bring uh, to Guardians. And I think it's, uh, it's quite unique in the action-adventure uh, kind of um, um, uh, kind of game, games. Uh, it's fresh, so like, and it puts you in the shoes of Peter. Like, you feel really engaged with the choices you're making. So it's something that we really wanted to carry forward. Uh, another aspect that we really wanted to uh, to bring to the table that we were also uh, pushing in Deus Ex games is uh, what we call internally the show don't tell. It's like the attention to all the details in the environment. We love when you get in a room somewhere and the way it's props the way it's staged like it tells you a story and as you're going to see in guardians of the galaxy especially when you go in the milano all the the, the characters have different uh, personal spaces and just like getting inside of the personal space of one character you're going to see so much detail that speaks to what that character is about and and we really wanted to to, to push it also through the environments uh, that uh, the, the guardians are going to visit through the adventure and lastly one thing that was really strong also in our previous work it was like all the narrative aspect like engaging you in a very uh, powerful emotional story that you want to know what what comes next and with this game like it's the same narrative team and some new blood as well that came uh, to to give life to our version of the guardians and the team did an amazing job to really embrace that version of the characters and the, the adventure we were going for and the way we build this game like each chapter kind of ends on a small cliffhanger 
always making you want to to know more so it can be cool at the end of chapter is it time to go to bed or it's uh, i'm going for another chapter because i want to know what happens uh, next so so we really brought that kind of uh, that kind of uh, narrative experience and uh, emotional uh, craftsmanship to to uh, to that experience i mean it's it's rooted in comic books like it's got a very you know serialized narrative kind of foundation there uh can you speak a little bit about what it was like working with marvel and marvel games i think it was really great to be honest because uh like i was saying with our first uh, conversation they wanted us to create our own version of the guardians and and we were aligned on that and we started to work and and develop the characters develop the story develop the environments and marvel they were always there with us to make sure that we achieve our vision so they were really trying to to help us achieve that and sometimes like we we had some ideas about a character or situation and uh, they, they, they would, uh, if uh, we didn't have necessarily the permission at the time, they would work super hard to give us the permission. Or uh, Bill Roseman, the, the creative director, would come sometimes, hey, you have this character in the game that would fit a perfect Marvel character that we have. And then we were going to explore and look at that character and was, oh my God, Bill is right, let's embrace it. So we felt like all the way through, they were there to make sure we were creating the greatest uh, Guardians of the Galaxy game we could. Now, this is, it's interesting because like with, with Marvel, obviously there's the cinematic universe and there's the video game universe oh, and there's the falling off the cliff oh. universe. Um, but there's... <laughs> There's sort of you know there's different you know there's different different timelines there's a lot of flexibility and this is this is clearly a unique set of guardians for this game but they do seem to exist within a larger Marvel universe was there uh, I guess what was the relationship like in that sense was there was there any kind of nudging in one direction or another was it asking permission to use uh, certain references to other parts of of the Marvel the universe the lore well it, it was. Oh, go Mary, please. Yeah, I, I would say it was a bit on both sides um, because within IDOS, you have a lot of Marvel fans and people who know this universe. And they, we were coming up with ideas and we were presenting it to them and saying, could we use this character? Would this work for this role in the game? And they were often agreeing with us. And other times we would maybe go to them and say, we have a character, but we don't know who would be best. And they would come back to us and they would say, hey, this character totally fits that role. Why don't you pursue that? And then we would look into it and inevitably they were right. And we just all created the best that we could together. I love it. I now, We've talked a little bit about sort of how how Peter Quill differs from his um, you know various on screen in comic book versions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the other the other team members and what they're what, what am I doing and <laughs> what, what they bring to the team Dying. aside from basic motor skills? <laughs> well, let's see. We have. Rocket and Groot. Um, every single one of the Guardians has been given a backstory that fits into our universe. So our universe is 12 years after this massive galactic war, and every Guardian had a role in that war. So from that, we start bringing it forward. Um, Rocket has his comic book origins of Half World, and we built on that. And uh, Groot comes from Planet X, uh, which was destroyed in the war. Uh, Drax, of course, has his family that he lost in the war. Uh, and Gamora, in the middle of the war, switched sides in order to get away from her father. So we, we built a lot of that story, and we looked at the comic books for influence on their designs and changed their looks according to things that we discovered. Now, we're starting to see sort of some of the different attacks we can, you know, command people to do, and I see there's, you know, there's obviously other, there's other slots there. How, is there like a skill tree? Do you sort of unlock different, you know, different abilities? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, we were talking that uh, all the guardians have different personalities, but they also have a different skill set. And uh, each character is going to have uh, several uh, abilities each, so uh, four each, so for 20 abilities to unlock as you go through the game. And uh, each character has a, a role to play. So for, for instance, if we start with Peter Quill, uh, uh, as the so-called leader is going to give comments to the, the other characters, but he also is a little bit of the jack of all trades. Like he can uh, uh, send uh, small bombs or he has a protective shield. Uh, he can uh, use his elemental powers, his, his jet boots, his, uh, his uh, melee skills and whatnot. Uh, when you go like a uh, character like Drax is more the tank, like he goes into the fray and he tries to take as many enemies at once and sometimes maybe he, try, he tries to chew too much at, at once and he can get in trouble, but he's good at uh, staggering the enemies because certain uh, archetypes will have a stagger bar that needs to be broken so you can inflict damage. And this is where Gamora comes into play because she's the assassin uh, and she can be very deadly. So she, she's the one inflicting uh, heavy damage. And Rocket is the area of effect guy that is able to snap several at me, uh, enemies at once with different of these uh, grenades that he built himself and whatnot. And uh, finally, you have Groot that is kind of the support guy that uh, will be able down the line to heal uh, the companions, is also able to immobilize like faster enemies and things like that. So he can be really useful and, and bring different uh, uh, opportunities to the table. And the way we, we, we build those abilities, there's a little bit of overlap between the characters, uh, but everyone has their own specialty. So as you go in the battlefield, uh, let's say you already use uh, one ability of a guardian and it, there's a cooldown happening, You're, you can still figure out other ways to go around with the other characters and Peter Quill. And what is cool is that uh, it creates a lot of opportunities to come up with different ways and plans to defeat the enemies and you can get very creative and it gets really rewarding uh, as you go and as you discover those abilities and how you can mix and match them. So yeah, it's, it's very clearly got some RPG mechanics, even if it, like at a glance you're like, oh, it's a third-person shooter. But you're yeah. uh, getting experimental here. Now, can we talk a little bit about what all the pink stuff is and what exactly the quarantine zone is? <laughs> you want to take it, Mary? Uh, sure. The quarantine zone is a place that all of the debris from this galactic war was basically towed to by Novacor and wrapped up in this protective nano resin. That's the pink stuff. Um, and it's basically so that all of this dangerous material can be kept away from everyone else. And slowly over time, the nano resin is growing and building and squishing everything together and in a way to get rid of all this dangerous technology. I don't want to make them wait. And so the guardians are poking around looking for, looking for some treasure, looking for some good stuff in here. Yeah, it's technically very illegal to go inside there, but they are, are hunting for a monster that they believe might be in there that they can then sell to a famous monster collector. Um, and along the way, of course, Rocket's like, why not pick up some illegal tech? It can always do wonderful stuff for us. I love it. And we've got, we've made a game out of it too. We're shooting these grubs. And then that's the, that's the scoreboard at the top there. Yes, that is the parasites that exist in this world. And Rocket and Star-Lord being rather playful and constantly teasing and challenging each other are engaging in a bet that Rocket challenged Star-Lord to who can be the better shooter. Okay, so we've got the basics down and we are going to jump ahead a bit and show some more mid-game combat when we're actually fully trained in what we're doing. Okay, so we've jumped ahead a bit. We are now in chapter five, a good chunk of the way into the game. We've got some combat abilities unlocked and we're gonna show them off in a second. We won't go into too much detail about what's going on here, but we're, we're gonna fight some bad guys. What is interesting here is the fact that, as uh, in the previous conversation, you had the choice to make yourself known to the enemies or not, and you decided to not to do that. So now you come in this fight with the uh, the advantage, and there are some 
uh, item in the environment that you could have taken advantage of, like the Gamera uh, uh, trait there that she can cut and uh, unleash uh, over the enemies. So depending on how you play the game and when you look at your environment, there can be different possibilities that you can use to really get rid of the enemies a little bit uh, more quicker and then finish it with the Guardian's abilities and your own abilities. And Peter also has a elemental attack now where you can freeze people. Absolutely. Uh, earlier in the game, uh, there the, the were uh, a very uh, tense moments that uh, Peter had to step up to save the Guardians. And uh, mysteriously, his gun connected to, to, uh, through his uh, skin, through his uh, DNA. And he doesn't understand how it happens, but it's a, a gun or a pair of guns that were left by his father that he never met. And somehow they're linked to him. So when there's a dire situation that happens, uh, the, the, gun, the guns unlock a new ability somehow that helps Peter to save himself and save his friends. So, and as you go through the game, you'll learn a little bit more about uh, those guns and how you can use them. All right, so now we've got a real tough bad guy here who has a shield, which I think is one of my yeah. biggest pet peeves in games, is those guys with shields because they're hard to <laughs> yeah. hit. Uh, we have a huddle ready. Should we, should we like, should we use that or should we save that for later? What do you think? Uh, I, th I think we can wait a bit because when we look at this guy, uh, I'm seeing you, you're shooting at him, he's, uh, he's defending himself. If you send Gamera right away, she won't be super efficient. I think at this point, like sending Drax first to try to to stagger the enemy is a good idea and see that the, the stagger bar now is getting filled and uh, now sending gamma rocket your uh your even uh, your uh, your super gun uh, ability is going to to, to uh, inflict a lot of damage but at, after a certain time like this enemy is able to recharge so you have to to pace yourself find the best strategy down, and boom, there we go. since you, you stayed uh, engaged in the combat and you managed to stagger him quickly, use the Guardians uh, in a good way, like it created uh, an opportunity for a combo. And uh, now you were able to finish that enemy super quickly. And, and that's the beauty of the game. As you're going to play with those different abilities, the environmental uh, uh, opportunities and whatnot, you're going to, to, to inflict a lot of damages uh, on the enemies. And uh, the, the ones that you'll see for the first time that will appear tough, when you meet them again, when you're more uh, acquainted with your, uh, your, your skill set, you're going to, to, to get rid of them uh, quite efficiently. And there are these sort of um, mines that are trapping people, which is a big, something you've got, yeah. someone's down. Yeah, the Grenadier is able to send those those um, drone mines, so to speak. And what you can do is that you can shoot at them directly to free your, your companion. So, uh, or if you didn't do it in time, you will have to revive your companion if you're able to do that. All right, and of course, killing people will give you some some health, which I desperately need. <laughs> you sure? Okay. You don't want to call that huddle? It might be time to call that huddle. Let's do yeah. it. Okay, so here we have it. I don't know what it says about my motivational speaking spell skills. I, I don't think I've gotten one of these right yet. <laughs> so guide so, me through this, yeah. Yeah, basically the Guardians are giving you feedback about what's going on. And uh, they're right now. They're saying like we're we're uh, we're getting um, swamped. So you you need to boost your your uh, your characters. Like give them the right speech. So I don't see super well on screen I right now. It's... Nope. Did I pick the wrong, the wrong one? Yeah. I told them to stop arguing. <laughs> I'm t see, I'm terrible at this. I'm like ah. <laughs> It, so. Basically, the way it works is that as they come in, when you call them, they will give you a feedback on how it's going on the, the, the battlefield. And there are keywords appearing in the backdrop that you can pay attention to. So after that, you get uh, two speeches that you can, uh, you can deliver. And if you deliver the, the, the proper one, it's going to uh, boost back all the characters, like full HP, everything will be good. And you can unleash their abilities like with almost no cooldown. So you, you, you will really feel the impact uh, on the battlefield. And uh, if um, 
you you don't deliver the right speech like you just did yeah. the guardians will go what the hell are you talking about so the only bonus they will have the, their hp will be back to normal but uh, you're not going to be able to spam their abilities but peter or him is going to be invincible is going to be fully uh, recharged and you can spam his abilities because he still think he delivered a great speech to his to his crew so for him it doesn't matter like guys you don't understand it that was awesome and his and as he finishes the speech, he unleashes one of his fav, uh, favorite tune on his uh, cassette player. And uh, the tune basically is the tune that inspired the, the, the speech he delivered. So. And there's the little sort of, uh, you perfectly timed the reload. You get a little bit yes. of an action, like a bonus Quick there. Reload. Yeah, if you, uh, you do the quick reload, uh, uh, at the right moment, you're going to get a boost in terms of damage on the enemy, but also you'll be able to return to full blasting uh, more quickly. So I'm. I'm what is I'm, interesting? Oh. I've, I've played this before, I swear. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, there is a. It's not just, you know. Not just straight shooting. There's a there's a fair amount of strategy. There's a bit involved. of strategy to it. Yes. Yeah. So so now because uh, Drax is incapacitated, you can uh, revive him if you want, if you have the time. Uh, but now you don't have access to his abilities. So dealing with this uh, uh, shield guy becomes a little bit more challenging. So what is interesting is always a balancing act like with what's going on on the battlefield. Do you go try to take the risk to revive your friend right away? Or you try to, to, uh, to deal with the other characters uh, as you go and everything. So it's, there's this risk and reward kind of a component. And now you decided to revive Drax. Now you can use him to, to stagger. Or in this case, uh, you manage to uh, <laughs> take advantage of a nice combo to get rid of him quickly. And there's, so there's a lot, of, a lot of action going on here. And occasionally you will get these sort of you know, quick time event cues or you know, yeah. like button cues. What are the so what are the states that cause those to happen? Actually, uh, as you you fight and you use your guardians and your own skill, you're you're uh, um, boosting your uh, momentum bar. And the more you do good in a fight, and the more like because you see those uh, those um, titles on screen, marvelous, fantastic, and all those things and the, the more you play with your team and you stay engaged with them the momentum fills and the more it fills and the the higher your 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 battling score is it increases the chances of having those uh, those combos with your 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 characters so when you inflict damage you break the stagger bar and, and you use all these uh, possibilities then boom uh, you're going to have these uh, opportunity to take them down uh, super quickly so it's it's really tied to all you fare in battles. I'm into it. Yeah, it's. Uh, I feel like it's very kind of you know hack and slash, you know beat 'em up mentality. But again, you're you know zapping people with ice blasts. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the ice uh, the ice element uh, can be really uh, powerful against like lesser enemies to freeze them right away, and you can just go with the melee and punch, and it, they shatter in, in pieces. Or like with the big guy with the shield, uh, using the uh, the the elemental ice on, on the shield actually it doesn't remove the shield, but it slows the enemy down, so it gives you a chance to go around and inflict damage or send Gamora and. And you're, you're opening up opportunities. So there are many ways that you can go around and f to find the best way to, to defeat those guys. So this is when I was talking about a little bit of overlap and different tools and the skill set for all the Guardians and Peter that you have. You can use them in very creative ways to, to, to get rid of uh, those enemies faster. Now, would it be safe to assume that if you have <clears throat> one element, there would be other elements that come later in the game? Absolutely. As you're going to go down uh, the adventure, uh, you're going to unlock three more uh, powers along the way. Uh, and again, it will happen through very dire situations for Peter and his friends. And as you see here, like you, you froze the lesser enemies, the grunts, and like you can get rid of them like super, super quickly. Love the use of 
explosive and barrels until by attacks. Drones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And again, in terms of flexibility, you could have shot at that barrel or just used drags like you just did. Uh, depending where enemies are on the battlefield, like the, the, there might be different ways to, to use that to your advantage. Can you go over what the... I feel like you've got all these wonderful, uh, I don't know, these Marvel adjectives like uncanny and amazing and marvelous. What is, what's the order for them? It's like, what's the best one? <laughs> Well, uh, um, the the latest, the, the last one, do you remember, Mary? I don't remember mm. which the last one is. I don't remember either. It might be Marvelous. It might That's be Marvelous. That's good to hear. I'm not sure. I love it. I it's it's think kind of got a... <laughs> the key is how many exclamation points. Ah. <laughs> I love because it. Because there's one excl exclamation point per level, basically. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's it's... It's it's got those those again the mar Marvel words like they're very very yeah. familiar adjectives which is it's cute there's and there's a lot of little you know little it, Marvel nods like that in here and basically it's there to give you the feedback on how you're faring with your guardians and the the higher and the more excl exclamation points like Mary said you have. Uh, the better you're faring, the more possibilities for combos you have. Uh, the Guardians will be much more efficient in battle, and you're filling also your uh, huddle bar even faster. So it's a gauge for you to know how you're doing in battle and to give you like the hints that you need to know that all those benefits that uh, come with it like are going to, to, be, uh, to be available to you uh, as you maintain that momentum because if you make mistakes and you, you you get it too much or you don't use the right guardians and everything your momentum can uh, can slow down and you can be broken and therefore you have to rebuild it to get back to the advantages that you can use down the line and now we kind of go back to a, a bit of a more environmental exploration stretch Yes, you can look around. Uh, sometimes you can find uh, what we call pocket secretaries, where there are some uh, storylines about what's going on in this facility that you can uh, get interested into. And what is nice is the fact that you, you just picked one up there. You can read it right away, but if you're like, no, I'll save it for later, you can go in the menus and, and read it, uh, save it for later, uh, or or just do it right now. And there's a, there's Here, what's an... What's interesting here is that if before you go up, there's a, if you look behind you, you have a costume that you can uh, you can find just behind. If you drop down, yeah, go up behind this, uh, behind the uh, yeah behind the platform, go behind, and you ah, I see get it. there we go. Yeah, what do we got? Ooh, Group Nova Corps. Let's try that on. Yeah. Let's get, let's check that out. These are, I'm... Here you go. I don't know how I feel about a tree wearing a jumpsuit. That's, that's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's this your is, call. This is great. It's I'm your a, version. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a huge sucker for just like collectible costumes, especially when they're they're nods to existing stuff. And it seems like you had a pretty pretty thorough job with that. Like it's very, there's a lot of like, specific citations of where the costumes came from which is awesome yeah we we have a uh, about 40 costumes and it covers a lot of ground like from the mcu costumes to the uh the comics the the various comics costumes and there are also some uh, unique costumes that were also created for this game and mary maybe she can talk a, a bit uh, about it but uh, for all costume there are nice descriptions that actually yeah. are really funny to read yeah, our writers had a lot of fun with that. Um, we just threw the costumes at this one writer, Ethan, and he had fun writing these little tidbits in the characters' voices. And then we sent them off to Marvel, and they provided us with all the comic background information to add. So it's a nice little thing to read those menus and find out where these costumes originated and to see how they fit into the lore of our universe. I love it. I mean, it's that's sort of a testament to how much writing there is in a game. You have to, to write about the tree's jumpsuit. Yes. <laughs>
So one thing people are obviously, you know, have their aversions to is, is microtransactions. To reiterate, these are these costumes are all just they're in the game. They're you, you they're, find them. They're all in the game. You have to find them. And what is interesting, and maybe the first play through, you might not find them all, and you replay and you find uh, the ones you miss and everything. And there's quite a bit to to collect. So it's all in the game. It's kind of a a very uh, uh, old school way, like everything is found in the game. Imagine that. Yeah. Now here's, let's see, we're going to unlock, do I have enough points for that? There we go. Uh, you right. have three points, yes you can, yeah. Eye of the Hurricane. It, it, actually, it's a, it's kind of a nod to another game we made, but <laughs> <laughs> it's called Das X with the Typhoon. I that. Yeah, I just got that. <laughs> It was a clay day uh, that we did, but, but it's a very cool and efficient ability. So now you see the, the skill tree for all the guardians. Uh, if you go, for example, in Gamera uh, skill tree, like it, it's all about like uh, like the deadly strike to inflict a lot of damage. Uh, Shadow strike, she can like hit many enemies at once and going super fast. And she also has a stagger wave that allows you, like let's say Drax is your specialist for stagger, but uh, uh, is in cooldown and now you, you're a little bit in trouble and you can use Gamoras. She will never be as efficient as Drax is, but she, she can help you. And if an enemy was almost staggered, she can finish it and now you can take advantage of it. So those are the kind of a little overlaps that we, we go through and uh, we go for uh, each character. Uh, here with uh, Rocket, uh, he has the, the, the basic uh, um, uh, cluster flower bomb that like deals a lot of uh, damage around you. Uh, the gravity stack grenade is a really nice one because uh, what it does and when it explodes, it takes all the enemies around and put them together in a in a spot. And now suddenly, do you use the the the, the, the Groot uh, Fury vines to like damage them or just send uh, Drax into uh, into that uh, that uh, spot and hit all the enemies at once? So the, uh, you can create different combos and uh, uh, like that. Um, uh, and uh, for all the characters, you have those those, those kind of things. And you may have noticed also that there's a, a, an ability that is with a question mark that you don't know what it is. And those abilities are being unlocked through the narrative because there will be a certain uh, moments in the game that will be a little bit tenser. There will be something happening where one of the Guardian will have to, to uh, uh, grow up, like to overcome uh, a personal uh, issue and as they go through these things it will unlock a new ability uh, for them at that point in time nice and here's so here's the milano which has been taken taken captive yes and finally we can uh, take it back and and fly away from this uh, weird base where a lot of weird stuff is happening this is this is one of those uh missions where if you try to fight everybody it doesn't really work you kind of have to just do the thing and get the hell out absolutely we call uh, those battles uh, internally we call them comzel like combat and puzzle kind of thing so comzel you have an objective to uh, to uh, to achieve and in this case what happened is that rocket was trying to release the the milano from uh, the clamps of the the station but they they got stuck somehow they got locked and now you have to go on the battlefield and, and uh, free the Milano from those clamps. But enemies keep coming, keep coming. So your role is to really uh, find the weak spot to, uh, to destroy them all uh, and not get killed along the way. So uh, the goal here is not to try to clean the room. It's to free the Milano and get away. That was a lot quicker than the first time I did it. I definitely <laughs> got lost, fell off the ship a few times. You start you start to look like us when we play the game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mary's going to be back in a little bit to tell us more about narrative in Guardians of the Galaxy. But right now we are joined by Marvel Games VP and head of creative Bill Roseman. Bill, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, and hello to all the true believers out there. Now, something I love as a you know longtime Marvel reader is that. You know, it's a it's a big universe. There's a lot to keep track of, and there's stuff in the game that is obviously original and bespoke for the game. And there's also, you know, there's some wonderfully deep cut references, as you were mentioning. And what I love is that it, there are proper citations to where in the comics they can be they can be found. Like, let's take a look here. We've got the uh, 
got the different costumes, and it's like here's here's Team Lord, here's Star Lord's, you know, hey, team team, there's my name. Yeah, right. Like you were editor, um, you know, on the on this comic when this came out, which is, you know, it's it's. This is this is another example of how uh, above and beyond the Idols Montreal team goes. They didn't have to do this. They could have just had the suit and maybe had the issue it came from, but they said, you know, hey, can you give us all the credits? You know, and in, uh, sometimes people just credit a writer or an artist as they should. They create it, but I'm like, ah, oh, the little people behind the scenes. They credit everyone. It's the inkers, the colorists, the cover artists, and even the editor, the behind the curtains uh, editor. So uh, everybody really pre appreciates that. And again, it's just a symbol of how uh, above and beyond they, they go. Um, I want to mention one other thing when you talked about anything that really tickled me. Here's another great example. Uh, the team had the idea of, hey, maybe Peter Quill gets his Star-Lord name from one of his favorite bands you know, when he was 13 back on Earth. And we're like, well, that makes sense. Um, because if you read the original comics from the 70s, it's very kind of convoluted how he gets his name. So they said, okay, it'll be a band. And, and they could have stopped there, but no. Then they created, uh, in the game, you see the Star-Lord album. It could have stopped there. No. They said, what if we do some songs? So they could have just done one song. No. They did an entire album of songs. Then they said, could we do a video? And we're like, please do. And so <laughs> that's just an example of they take one thing and they pour their hearts in it and they, and, and they just go add, 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 add. They didn't have to, but they, it, it spoke to them. And, and it spoke to the Guardians. The Guardians is this sci-fi rock and roll misfit band. So it all, it all works. It all, it's new, it's innovative, but it feels authentic. No, it's wonderful. I I also love that in you know you've got you've got a Kiss song on the soundtrack, and back in the days of your Kiss had a comic where they fought Doctor Doom. Like it's all it's all sort of circular. Exactly. Mar Marvel has a history. Uh, you know, we're Marvel is very rock and roll, and Marvel, as you said, has that authentic history of of having um, bands star in comics, having characters reference music. So uh, it all makes sense, and that. Um, the logo on the back of uh, Peter's jacket, Star Lord, that is the band's logo, uh, a patch that he then put on his jacket because he thought it was the coolest thing ever. It, it's such a, it's such a good, to, like, to think he could have been also called like Lover Boy or Foreigner, you know, like there's. <laughs> Looked out with Star Lord. Star Lord. So we are here at the Collector's oh, uh, and one Emporium. More thing. The, the songs that they made, the songs that they made, uh, and the lyrics they wrote, they all speak to the heart of the team. And you see the kind of values and ideas that drive Peter in the lyrics of the song. And, and it's all reflected in who the Guardians are and the kind of missions they take on and that idea of family and responsibility, but also kicking ass and, and going from zero to hero and riding through space. Uh, it's all there, it's all there, it's brilliant. No, it's it's awesome, and there's there's even a part where you have to do sort of like a karaoke showdown, which, um, you know, for the sake of, of not spoiling anything, we're gonna not gonna show that, but it's it's ear splitting. Yes, and you know, and uh, they were so smart, you know, in 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 the Guardians films to use music to ground and humanize Peter, and it's a great a constant reminder of oh, he's the one from Earth. Like dolls. And, and it's this music that really makes them relatable. And now we've embraced that across Marvel with the Guardians and music. So it's it's part of the rich history now. And, and, and again, I think the teams did an awesome job. Um, and, you know, that leads right into the, the rest of the soundtrack. There's, there, there's the uh, orchestral, there's the um, licensed songs. It's just a music lover's dream. Now, JF, can you tell us a little bit, we're about to head into the, the Emporium here and I'm I mean, based on what I've seen in the movie, that is jam-packed with all sorts of like details and Easter eggs, and I'm dying to see what you've done uh, in this space. Well, the uh, we're in nowhere, and there are plenty of places to visit, and it costs money. And if you remember at the beginning of the game, you were trying to make a little bit of money. You decided to sell either Groot or Rocket uh, eventually, and then you, you earn some money yeah. to pay your fine. But now you're on this uh, space station nowhere, 
at the edge of uh, the, the universe. And, and there's many temptations. There's many places you can go, but there's nothing free. So you can spend money to, to go. And uh, the Emporium is one of the museums uh, that you can visit. And it's a place where there are the collector collected artifacts from across the galaxy from different places. And if you're a Marvel fan, uh, you're going to discover a lot of lore uh, in, in this place. But uh, again, like this place is not free. You need to pay money to enter. Or you might explore something and go in other places on nowhere. And maybe you can find a way to get in for free. So it. Uh, it will be up to players to, to figure it out. I love it. This is this is the kind of like weird Easter egg detail I'm I'm completely here for. Here's a I don't know a frog sized Mjolnir. There you go, wielded by a certain frog. And what's so great is is the, both of the teams we really um, don't even think about it as Easter eggs. I mean they they are hidden and uh, or or you have to seek seek them out and and they are you know rewards to to Marvel fans or if you don't know about it you can learn about it. But instead of calling them Easter eggs, we like to think of them as building blocks. Like if you were in the Marvel Universe, these are the things you would hope to see. And again, the team's just gone above and beyond. Uh, all of these are thought out, we talked about them, uh, all the text there, um, you know, it's all authentic, you can read about it. Uh, they really, again, poured, poured so much effort into this in, 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 the, in the hopes of delighting players. No, it's wonderful. I mean, we've seen, you know, obviously there's there's a massive sprawling Marvel universe to keep track of with, um, you know, various di different timelines and whatnot. And then we've got the MCU, which is starting to branch out on its own. And then there's sort of, you know, in the video game vicinity, it's it's kind of kind of the Wild West. And it's really cool seeing, you know, different teams take different creative approaches. And, you know, well, clearly. that's what that's what's fun about this this current generation of Marvel games, you know, about, you know, seven years ago, uh, we formed a new team with a new mission. And, and part of that is we wanted to give our, uh, our partners, our collaborators, freedom. We didn't want to tie them in between uh, movies or in between comics or TV shows. Um, and, we didn't, and, and that same thing goes for the players. We didn't want the players to feel that they had to see something else, read something else to understand the game. We want to give them freedom to tell their story. So if they want to blow up planets, blow up the moon, they can do it. So what we do, is we just we we just supply ingredients, you know, to the creators. In this case, Idos. We said, okay, if, oh, there's Throg. We said, if you're going to make a Guardians game, you know, the ultimate Guardians game, what's the wish list of characters, locations, items, weapons, you name it? And so we just supplied all this stuff, and we said, here's all these comics, here's all these lists. You pick. What do you want to have in your Guardians game? So, um, you know, if you've if you've read the comics, you'll you'll see a lot of things you're familiar with. If you've only seen the films, it'll look familiar, but it's distinct. It's its own original story, its own Marvel universe. Uh, but it really it really very much is the Marvel universe. Among other places. That's right. Nowhere. Decapitated head of a celestial, now home to scientists, traitors, scum and villainy. The what could go wrong? <laughs> Nothing. Jay, walk us through a little bit. We're uh, we've kind of been abandoned by, well, everybody. I guess it, Drax took off. Yes. Is not around. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, at that point, like. Uh... Rocket and Groot uh, are, are gone for some reasons. And uh, you, you get to nowhere and you're with uh, uh, Gamora and Drax. And um, at some point, you, uh, you stumble on someone and boom, Gamora disappears mysteriously. OK, where's she? We don't know. We don't hear from her. And then Drax is in his head. Is is uh, he has a lot of thoughts about uh, his family, his past, and everything. And nowhere, it's a place he comes at times to to reflect on certain things. But you don't know that. And at this point in the story, he wants to take some some time off to 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 reflect on stuff. And then he goes on his side. And you, as Peter, you're like, 
okay, well, I'm going to see Cosmo alone, I guess, and uh, because we still have to, to, uh, to bring the message and see if he has heard anything about the mystery going in the galaxy. And as Peter, you're, you're, you're in this hub, and now you have the freedom to go straight to Cosmo, or, or like we just did a bit with the Emporium, to, to go around, visit, see what Nowhere has to offer. Uh, there might be also opportunities to make a little bit of money with some kind of games and not. And, uh, and basically at that point, players, tot players are totally free to, to, to fully explore nowhere or just get the business done and go see Cosmo. Nice. Well, let's, let's head up to Cosmo's Tower and see where that takes us. And uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure everything will go smoothly. This is, you know, the Guardians, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Nothing ever goes sideways. <laughs> It always Wait, goes according Cosmo to the plan. Us. He loves us. <laughs> I love these. I love these aliens. Like, there's just. I. I feel like there's kind of, you know, you know, a few sort of main races in, in Marvel space, but there's a lot of freedom to just get very, you know, colorful with it. Yes, we were trying to make it feel like a place where aliens from across the galaxy are converging for different businesses or to have fun or whatever the, it's going on with them. And it needed to feel as such like it's not just like uh, you can see a, a, a few people from Earth or Earth like, but for the most part, there are aliens from from different places, from Greece to alien that we we, uh, we created uh, at Adidas Montreal as well. So, and uh, here we have uh, Star Lord that wants to go to see Cosmo, but uh, this guy says like the bridge behind me is closed; he cannot go through that path. So you need to go down that dark alley. Uh, alley, sorry, and uh, it's a little bit strange. Uh, actually, it's quite odd, and uh, we'll see. Uh, what's going to happen there. And uh, what is cool with what you're showing is that you passed through it already, but uh, you could have gone on the side of the, uh, the rail and Peter will, uh, you can interact with the rail and is going to lean and just watch at nowhere and put his Star Lord music on and things like that. Again, it's, it's details that you don't have to experience to enjoy the game, but if you're looking everywhere for all the details, you can, you can uh, experience those things. Uh, if you're looking for it, it's just, uh, it's close by where there's a little bit of light here to your left. And that's the kind of, uh, a detail that we we go for so uh, it can be fun to spend time in nowhere and that's the kind of the experience we were going for like you're on nowhere you have an objective but there might be temptations to to just enjoy life or just take it easy take your time and everything and that's it, it, what is going to be cool is players who are all about like exploring everything they will be rewarded and if you just you're about the, the the mission you will still be rewarded by a lot of twists and turns well let's save some of those twists and turns for later um, we have some more stuff to check out but let's let nowhere you know be a surprise for now all right so we're actually jumping back a little bit now this is a previous chapter uh jf still with us and joining us once again is mary demarle who is the senior narrative director uh mary what's going on here well, we've jumped a little bit into the story. The Guardians have been together for a little while, and their schemes have to to basically sell themselves as heroes for hire have not had a lot of success. So they're, they're short of cash. They desperately need it. So they've kind of embarked on this new scheme where they want to sell a monster to an infamous monster collector, Lady Hellbender. But they didn't have a monster. So they basically decided, well, let's sell Rocket or Groot and see what we can get. And that's a player's choice. So the choice for you is you decide who's gonna make the better monster. And in making that choice, it will impact this mission because first of all, you'll be selling somebody different and we'll see what happens in terms of how successful you can be. And in this particular instance, I think we're gonna sell Groot. And this leads to a different gameplay mechanic as well, because we're going to start some stealth missions because the whole idea is we're going to sell our teammate, 
But then we're going to sneak back in and steal our teammate back. Okay, and so that this, way we get the money. This is interesting because I've, I've played this before, but I chose to sell Rocket. And yes. that's, I guess, there's there's no stealth in that case. Is that right? There's no stealth in that case because you're dealing with the characters themselves. And each of the Guardians are very true to who they are, but they can be very unpredictable to you. So if you know a bit about Rocket, when you try to sell him, Rocket can be very volatile if things don't go his way. And unfortunately, the way he reacts leads to guess what? We're not going to be able to steal you back. We're just going to steal the money and go. <laughs> An entirely different circumstance. Yes. Now, I love this because the entire time you've been here, Drax has basically been hyping up Lady Hellbender. And he's just, oh, yes. he, he thinks she's the coolest. And then he meets her and he's like, you're not, you're not 800 feet tall or whatever. <laughs> Yes. He basically has heard her legend. He's heard all her stories. He's been regaling the Guardians with these stories all the way and building her into this massive myth. And in his mind, she's a giant. And she is quite big. In fact, she's bigger than all of them. However, she's not really a giant that he was expecting. It's, it's and as you horrible. can see, she takes a um, interest in him, Drax the Destroyer. Oh, I love this. This is just like my fan fiction. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm, I know a, a lot of Marvel stuff, but Lady Hellbender is uh, a blind spot for me. What is, what is her background in the comics? Is she old, new? Well, What's is, her deal? For us, this was uh, where the collaboration with Marvel really came together because we knew we wanted a character who would be a strong female character who they would sell the monsters to. And we had created our own version, but we weren't really sure and we went to Marvel. And as soon as they heard it, they said, hey, Lady Hellbender is somewhat new. She's, I think, introduced in The Incredible Hulk. And they basically said, why don't you take this character and see what you can do with her? So in our story, we went in and we read those comics. We got to know Lady Hellbender and we reinvented her character a little bit. She's the queen on this planet. She loves monsters. Um, she freed the planet from the controlling priests who once ruled it and demanded worship and mistreated all the monsters. And she's become the ruler here. What do you mean, no? I mean... I love that. I mean, that's that's adaptation. That's how you, you know, get creative and interesting with it. And it's, it's sort of fun to see the different spin put on everything. Yes. She actually has two... Um, monsters that are her sidekicks all along we call them she calls them nasher and gasher and if you are familiar with the comics nasher and gasher are two of her henchmen they aren't monsters they're henchmen but we knew that they were important characters for her and we turned them into these big monsters that she actually rides as steeds oh that's awesome yeah i mean i like it's this is a, it's a world where there's a talking raccoon like yes. get, get weird have fun like <laughs> you've got a pretty high ceiling for what's possible so this is also what we would call something of a battle of wits where you are trying to get something from this other character who is resisting and you're using the dialogue choices to do it this particular conversation can go in many many different directions if you're selling Rocket, um, it will go one way. Here, selling Groot, you can get different amounts of money based on your skill at negotiation. But here you've succeeded, and he's being taken away to the monster pens where her collection is. And ultimately, they're going to now sneak in at night and steal him back. And there's Nasher and Gasher. Oh, they're cute. I like them. <laughs> so yeah, this is wild. I totally, I was like, did I, like, did I, what, did I screw up? Like, what did I, I didn't, I'm like, this doesn't sound familiar. That's cute. I like that. <laughs> no, no, of course I will. I'll call you, I'll call you. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, this is an entire section of game that you won't see if you pick a particular option. I love that kind of stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So, this is now hours later. It's at night. Uh, there was true Hellbender style. Everybody was partying and celebrating, and the fortress has gone to sleep for the night. And the guardians are now going to try and sneak past everybody in order to get to Groot. Oh man! Well, man. Hopefully they didn't freeze Groot in any sort of space metal. Hopefully we don't run into any wind chimes on our way in here. Yeah, like post post uh, house party space aliens is extremely. <laughs> it's a thing. And again, the Guardians are relatively new as a team. They've been together for about a year. They kind they know each other, but they really haven't gelled as a team yet. So. In the course of the game, you're learning about the unpredictability of them as you get to know them. She knows how to throw a party. It was like this with the Ravagers, too. This is a di different kind of stealth than I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, if you want to talk on it? Well, here, the, the goal is, like Peter said, like when he said, uh, OK, let's go get Groot, like no, no screaming, no stepping on anything. And that's exactly what you need to do. You need to avoid like to, to hit the bottles or to, to hit the guards that are half uh, asleep or inebriated and, uh, and try to find uh, Groot. Because Rocket, he has his device and he's, he knows roughly where where he is, so the goal is to try to, to locate him. And even though they're stealthing, you see they are still talking. It's very hard for them to be quiet, uh, or actually to just stop talking. There, it's, it's not exactly the most, you know, tactical approach, but, you know, why not tease Drax in the moment? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it's it's still uh, Guardians of the Galaxy style. Okay, that's, I, I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't this, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I will trust his doodad. <laughs> and it's interesting as you listen to the banter, because you do pick up about former missions and things that they've done, and you get, you get a sense of how this team has approached missions in the past and not been very successful. Yeah, there's something really fun about that that feels also authentically comic booky for a team to already have been, you know, in place and not have this not be a complete origin story. Yes. They've got they've got some baggage. See now it's the same uh, the same throne room as we visited when we tried to negotiate with uh, Lady Elbender, and now we saw uh, we saw she took Groot through one of those elevators, and now the guardians are trying. Okay, if we want to find Groot, we need to find uh, a way to activate that elevator, and they're going like, okay, how do we do that? And the goal here is to try to find an access to her throne uh, seat because it looks like she activated. Uh, stuff from there. So if you can reach up uh, through a small uh, puzzle, then uh, you're going to um, to hopefully be able to use the elevator that uh, uh, will uh, again hopefully lead you to group. And in this puzzle, you've been using Star Lord's visor, which is a very helpful tool. It not only will help you in the course of this as you're solving the puzzle, but as you're viewing the environments and you're reading about stuff, it gives you some of the lore, some of the history, uh, gives you clues in this case as to what you can use. And again, we were talking earlier about the amount of writing that has to be done. Having to write all the texts for these visors, I think the quarantine zone itself just had so many things that, that we made up lore for. And also, and also, and also, in what you're saying, Mary, uh, it, it doesn't take account uh, what you said. The fact that you might be playing in a certain order, and you have to have the lines that also 
uh, adapt to in uh, which order you do things because it needs to be acknowledged, it needs to be recognized. And as you go through the environment, sometimes you might look at objects and the backdrop and everything. And if you look at these things, it will trigger conversations that otherwise you would never have. Exactly. So in this, basically, Rocket is uh, giving you through your own visor an access to all the electronic devices and all they're connected. And your goal is try to, to uh, get the power to activate the elevator. The thing is, uh, those, those connectors lead to different places or different systems. So you might make a mistake and they can have some sort of uh, outcome that is not necessarily what you were expecting. Like this? Like this. Okay. <laughs> Skilling permitted now, Peter Quill. Yes, now, yes, now. Classic, yeah. No, it's, I was like, this is. There's no way this is gonna go smoothly. <laughs> but it's possible to uh, to achieve this without uh, disrupting any of the Hellraisers, and you can continue uh, smoothly. Or here, you just have a small uh, recess. Now, periodically in the game, you'll have situations where one or more team members have been taken out of action, which completely changes the whole dynamic because, like, that one, you know, rocket grenade attack you've been spamming suddenly isn't isn't available. Okay. And it forces you to to uh, to adapt uh, your 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 uh, battling style. And there will be also moments in the game where, uh, like for instance, here you didn't have Groot, so you have to deal without Groot. So if you're used to immobilize enemy now, enemies, and now maybe you you miss it. Like oh, I wish I had Groot. And there might be other moments in the game where some guardians may or may not be uh, with the rest of the team as well. Now let's see, am I totally screwing this up? There we go. That's something. There you go. It's definitely one of the stealthiest missions I've ever been on. Just throwing rocks, giant stone steps. <laughs> it's not classic stealth. <laughs> it's probably how I would perform stealth in real life. <laughs> there we go. Is it the... Oh. That's the other thing about the Guardians. They constantly improvise. So they found the wrong elevator, but we're going to get down there anyway. What could go wrong? <laughs> This is, all, this is all completely new to me. I'm, I'm... He's a scut. Right on cue. It's not that. Something's wrong. Heads up, more guards. I will give a wide berth, Pukewill. Oh, come on, you hunk of chunk. It's a lot of bottles. They party hard. Yeah. Clearly, we're enjoying some delicious maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Straight from Canada. <laughs> now... Is it is it like instant fail if I wake one of them up or do I just fight everybody? It's going to be an instant fail. Like the goal okay. is really to yeah. Well, I won't knock over the bottles then, unless I <laughs> by accident. In which case, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ooh, that's fun. Uh, and you, you you didn't explore, but in this room uh, there was also, I think, a costume you could um, have found. Oh yeah. I want a costume. Okay, well, <laughs> in the interest of time, I guess we have to go back. Yeah, so that's like a that's a whole stretch I didn't see, and that's why I don't have more costumes. All right. Well, I think we're about out of time here, but luckily, here's Groot. He's doing okay. Mary, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a, it's been a treat hearing how much. Dialogue has gone into this. You're going to be clearly doing a lot <laughs> it's of writing. Been fun. It's been fun watching you play. All right. When one guardian leaves, another steps in to take their place. And joining us now is Steve Shepkowski, who is the senior audio director for Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. And you did a lot of audio directing. There's quite a lot of um, sounds, but also a lot of music. You've got a crazy licensed soundtrack here, as well as an original one. 
Uh, let's let's check this out. Let's get into it. This is the very introduction of the game, very beginning. We get to meet both Star Lord, the character, but also Star Lord, the band. What's going on there? Well, we were asked to uh, create a band that represented the reason why Peter Quill chose the name Star Lord because he grew up loving this band in the '80s. Like a lot of us did when we were at that age, you know, 14, you'd put the, the band that you represented on your, your jacket. So that's how he kind of came about in our universe about taking his name. So JF, uh, creative director, asked me to look into seeing if we could go a bit deeper and create an album. And we looked into the logistics and uh, I found uh, a good writing partner. And then we just started over the course of the development cycle, banging out songs and sending them over to JF. Um, we also sat down at one point, JF and I, and kind of created a list of sort of the themes and topics I would cover lyrically. And then from that point, if I found that I was stuck, I would go back to that list and be like, okay, what didn't I write about yet? And I would find something new, you know? So, um, yeah, it was really exciting. It was really fun. I mean, I look at it now and kind of amazes me that it all came to life. This is, I mean, this is crazy because, like, you think when you're making that's a video actually game, you're me. Also, that's actually is that me you? in that photo. Yeah, the one right on the uh, the end there. So the was left. this like your band in high school, or just? It was a band at some point in the '80s, and some guys in the actual band were photoshopped out for some of the dev team guys. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, it's crazy. But like I'm... you, you know, you think you're working on a game, but you also have to make an album at the same time. That's kind of an undertaking. Uh, yeah, this, but I don't mind. I like challenges. Yeah. Now, this blew my mind. You've got an actual issue of Rolling Stone to really kind of help establish. Well, again, yeah. I like, I, like, I like making dreams come true. And JF came to me and he's like, hey, what do you think to add credibility if we could get Rolling Stone in there? So I'm like, all right, let me use my, uh, let's see what kind of pull I can get. And I asked around. Thankfully, I had a really good um, partner in all this, uh, Randy Eckhart from Eckhart Consulting, who helped us with all the music licensing, and he had a contact at Rolling Stone, so A plus B, and we got to C, and we got into talks with them, and we told them what we wanted, and it even, they were so accommodating, they provided us one of their writers, who I then sent the finished album to, he listened to it all, he did the review, he interviewed me, so it's, it's as credible as you can get, it's a real Rolling Stone writer, who wrote, we synced with Rolling Stone, we got all their fonts for the art direction. Anymore, you couldn't get more okay. credible unless you found it on the rack. Yeah, so that's bonkers, because I'm used to seeing in games, you know, there's like, oh, it's like Spinning Rock Magazine, or like Time, yeah. you know, like Clock Week, or whatever, and it's like... Well, we have we have those posters on the wall. If you look around the room, there's some interesting uh, sort of Eidos Montreal versions of uh, pop culture. It's a it's a mix of both. I'm I'm very into it. Uh, now this is this is Peter's mom here who's reminiscing yep. about the good old days. Yeah, she's a great actress. Uh, we we were really blessed with a really strong cast. So, you know, it's it's one of those, you know, the writers did a great job, and then we just have to sit back and let them all shine. You know. Now there's a bit here that I I really, JF, maybe you can speak to this, but talking about having to email people and get the rights to use certain things and do certain stuff. Uh, she just stepped well, on something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's chewy. <laughs> we'll see it in a second. Yeah, it's chewy. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, like Steve said, uh, we really wanted to be uh, to be authentic. And uh, as you start the game and you're with young Peter, he's a kid of the 80s. So we were trying to really ground um, uh, uh, ground the player players in that era and everything, and uh, the the Chewbacca figurine was uh, something that uh, actually it, it, it's something in my own life. When I was five years old, it's the first figurine I ever discover walking outside of the house, and I, I didn't see Star Wars back then. And when I saw this, it was the most beautiful thing I ever. I ever <laughs> saw as a toy and I was so blown away and, and that story I still remember it to this day uh, uh, years after and when we started to work on this I had this idea that the kid like how do we ground it in that period of time with something iconic that will be known across the world 
And, and, and Chewbacca for me was representative of that. And, uh, but it was not an easy road. Like uh, at first, like it was, no, we cannot do that and everything. And actually uh, I, I, I work with uh, people at Marvel for over a year to, <laughs> to try to, to have that happen. And, uh, and it finally happened. Like everybody eventually got on board and it was super exciting. So the day that I received the confirmation we could use it, I was in the studio and I went, yeah, we got it. And the people like, wah, wah, wah. oh, he's, he's talking about the Chewbacca figurine. It's so cool. <laughs> I love it. Like, I mean, it's, it's weird because you do have, you have the, you know, the Idos Montreal, where here's the, the hit 80s film for things, you know, looks a little familiar, but clearly not from our universe. And then you jump over here and there's like, there's Tron, you know, it's like, it's, it, it grounds it in a very familiar universe, even if it's not quite, you know, the one we're in exactly. Can't believe I caught this. That maiden show was awesome. Yeah, I mean, you've got you've got actual Iron Maiden over here, which is which is amazing. Uh, Steve, can you talk a little bit about the the licensed music and what it was like, kind of getting the rights to use that? Uh, we we can't actually play sure. any of it because you know the, the lawyers and all that. But uh... <laughs> I'm very familiar with the lawyers. Believe me. But yeah, we, uh, like, like I said, I was very lucky in that I was introduced to Randy Eckhart, and that's, that's me playing the guitar very badly at home, trying hard to just pretend I'm going through the licks there. My calluses. But I thought that was really cool that you could pick up the guitar and interact with it, and I play like, sort of like as if he's learning the, the licks to the songs on the cassette. So for the license, go ahead. So yeah, for the licensed music, like I said, I was very lucky that I, I needed a, a partner who knew though how to tread those waters very well. Um, so I'm working with Randy Eckhart. He's uh, from all the Guitar Hero fame. He worked on putting all that license together. So that was an invaluable partner. We worked together for probably two years. Uh, and, and, you know, from starting out with pitching uh, you know rough song ideas and you know occasionally sitting down with JF and looking at the songs we had and you know I'd sit there saying I'm thinking of getting this one or that one and just making sure there was no red flags and we were all aligned and sometimes he would have ideas and then I'd go to Randy and he would do all the the street work you know he would go and make all the phone calls and then come back and be like yay or nay they're interested or they're not and we would adapt our list accordingly and just keep moving on until we, we shaved it down to what we have now in the game, which is 31 tracks. But what was, but what was fun, it was to go, like you said, Steve, going through all the songs, listening, like going back on YouTube and like uh, putting ourselves back in those days and finding the, the right songs, like with the right vibe, the, the right lyrics for the scenes we had and everything. So it was quite, uh, it, that, that was the legal part, but from a creative standpoint, that, that was really fun to, 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 to dig back in some of those great, uh, awesome songs. Yeah, it made me realize just how much good stuff there was in the 80s that kind of, you know, it, it, there was just, there was a lot of good content. I mean, there was a lot of fluff too, but I mean, I think there was a lot of good stuff that got overlooked that when we went back now, we were like, wow, this really, this really aged well. It still fits. Yeah, if you're not, you're not a metalhead, there's plenty of stuff on the soundtrack that is, you know, it's just. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We made sure that we didn't pigeonhole it as much as Peter's like a metal fan. We wanted to give a pretty rounded um, sort of view of, I would say, the more of the early 80s period, like the front. I mean, I think JF would agree. I think the main focus is the first five years of the decade, and we have some from the latter half. Um, but it's a lot of rock. It's a lot of pop and new wave, like the stuff that was really big at the time. The betrayer is ready to begin our mission. It's a good time. Can you speak a little bit about sort of the role that music plays in, in Guardians of the Galaxy? Because obviously we've seen, you know, we've seen it on the big screen, but it, it has a, I feel like a much more uh, kind of integral role in the, in the game itself. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely infused into their DNA. I mean, it's part of Peter Quill's, it's almost part of his personality, right? Like the music is part of the way he kind of uh, either communicates or interacts, or maybe that's his go-to in awkward situations. I mean, you know, we all use music for different reasons, either to unwind or maybe sometimes to pump us up. So again, that plays into the huddle mechanic that we uh, we worked on, where you know uh, the team had this great idea to sort of have this this huddle bit, 
and again, like I was just always trying to, I knew Guardians was a big sort of like music was important. So I was always trying to look for ways to kind of jump and piggyback. Like I'm like that kid running around like, what are you doing? Can I play? Can I play? And trying to find where I can kind of find ways to get audio more present in the game. And when I showed um, JF, like just by dumb luck of just playing around and putting licensed music under combat. And he was like, wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. And, and then we just kept exploring it. And once we put sort of like the game direction side and added the sort of cherry on top of the music at the end, I mean, the huddle part is great because it really reinforces you being the leader of the team. And, and, you know, it's, it's not something like I know sometimes, um, you know, maybe some people feel it kind of slows down the combat, but I disagree. I think it's an important moment in the story and in the game where it puts you back and, and it reminds you that you're the leader of this team. And it's an important thing to not forget, you know, so I thought it was a really good mechanic to have in the game. And I was just happy to be able to kind of get the music in there and, and you know, to kind of help round it out a bit, you know. Okay, so obviously, you know, the Guardians are going to spend a lot of time hanging out on the Milano, which is, it's, you know, it's their home. It's a, it's a little hangout here. Uh, JF, can you tell us a little bit about sort of what's, what there is to explore in here, what we're going to see? Well, uh, the Milano is the home of the Guardians. So throughout the adventure, as they fly from one destination to another, uh, they will spend time in the Milano. And what is cool, the way we build it, so it, it's a recurring place that you're going to visit. And uh, depending like, uh, okay, you finished a mission, boom, the Milano flies away. You're back in the Milano with your guardians. You can decide to explore. Or if you just want to go for the next, uh, the next adventure and the next part of uh, what they're trying to, 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 to achieve, you can just go to the pilot seat and just fly for the next destination. But if you want to spend some time with your guardians, uh, there will be plenty of opportunities. And, and each visit that you go, uh, you go through the, um, the Milano, there will be uh, different things. Like, of course, you can go and visit the, the room of all the guardians. Like, there's a lot of show, don't tell that tells you uh, more about those characters. And as you go through different missions, you're going to be able to, um, uh, to if you explore a bit in the environments, to find some what we call guardians collectibles. And those collectibles are uh, associated to all of the guardians. Like, you have, I think, something like 15 to find in the game. Uh, and there are three per guardians and basically what it does it evokes back a memory about their lives and as you collect those things they will uh, they will be in the milano and you can interact with them and unlock those personal conversation with the different guardians and learn more about them and what's cool is that if it's not something that you're into you don't want to spend time on it you don't have to do it but if you're into discovering those those characters and and their lives there, there there's a lot to to do there and as you go through the adventure I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, the Guardians will meet different characters and some might get in the Milano. You will have moments to, uh, uh, to interact with them in the Milano. Uh, and there will be some, there might be some part of some missions that happen in the Milano as well. And, um, and again, you have other things like uh, you showed already, like you can go to the jukebox, you can uh, scroll to all the lists of uh, license tracks and the Star Lord tracks. And if you want to spend a lot of time there and just like listening to music, enjoying the time of, it, it, it can be uh, really nice. And uh, another thing also is that as you stay there and maybe you just listen to music and you do nothing else and you wait the guardians can start like different conversations about different stuff that you never heard before and you're like it feels like Holy a really, moly. It feels like, yeah. a real, like really hanging out with them like it's you can put on some music and kind of chill out i, I think the most guardians thing here is someone leaving the fridge open because <laughs> you know it's a little bit of a frat house um, yeah it, but there's you, there's so like, many awesome details in here i love that uh you know people keep using peter's toothbrush <laughs> It's like cribs in space. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Drax's kettlebell is great. His yoga mat, that's just, I don't know, you always see ripped Marvel characters. You never see their exercise gear. That's a nice touch. And then, you know, Gamora's room is just like oddly, you know, kind of a teenage girl's bedroom, but she's reading The Art of War. This, this is great. It's really, it's really cool. And uh, without spoiling too much, at some point in the story, there's someone who gets in the Milano and decides to lock himself up 
in Peter's bedroom. And Peter goes like, did he just take my, my personal space? And Drax goes uh, something like, it's a, it's a bold display of dominance. And, uh, uh, and there are those moments like that. And uh, uh, it's really fun. And uh, it, it goes back to, 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 to what you just said, like it, it's their home. It's, it, it needs to feel lived in and, and they have like natural conversations, like when you're at home with friends or family, and stuff like that. So we really wanted to, to craft a unique experience for all uh, of the visits of the Milano you'll have throughout uh, the adventure. I like JF was saying. No, it's, like, it's a good touch. I've had it. Oh, go ahead. Oh. No, go ahead. You're, you're right. No, I was just going to say, like JF was saying, like, and I can't sell the point enough. If you're into hanging out and interacting with them, like the content, I mean, right up until the end, I think I was occasionally, because obviously when we're playing the game, we're not playing it for necessarily the experience we're playing it to test the game and make sure like this is fixed and that but i was finding like these crazy conversations that i i never even had heard before and this is like after you know playing the game for like three years and you're sort of like did you you know i'd, I'd sync with one of the audio guys and i'm like i was just doing this thing and groot was watering something and they got into this whole argument about and he's like what he's like that's crazy and i said i know i never heard that before so it's it really gets really deep. Like there's so much value there into the time that you spend with your guardians, you know? Yeah, I've had, I've had moments where I've been, you know, like I'll be hanging out in Milano and I'll put the controller down without pausing it and I'll hear people talking and I'll like run back. I'm like, is it a cutscene? Is something happened? It's just like, <laughs> it's just like Drax and Groot arguing. And I'm like, okay, never mind. It's just, <laughs> it's like stupid friends. <laughs> life aboard the Milano. Yeah. And here's, I love this is Groot's little hangout, his little yep. arboretum. He loves plants. Nice. Is that one from Seknarf 9? I bet it loves water. No, it's it's wonderful. There's a phenomenal amount of detail in here. Now let's see, is there anything? Let's let's check out the uh, the upgrade bench. Which the workbench. Here we go, well, yeah. There you go. So I love the only Rocket's the one who's doing this. He's gonna do all your tinkering. Correct. But the game it's, is always the game is always reacting to you. So depending on the missions and how you played it, you know, Rocket may or may not be in the mood to upgrade your stuff. I'm sure JF could go into more detail on that. But it's it's one of the great things about how the game is always shifting with how you're playing it. Yes, and uh, with uh, Rocket is that uh, sometimes there might be events that happen where he's not there and therefore you cannot craft or uh, when he's pissed, it will still craft for you. But like uh, Steve just said, uh, the way he approaches it, like he will have a different mood uh, to fit with his general mood and, and it creates for some uh, funny moment. And the uh, the crafting bench, actually, it's uh, we talked about the skills of the Guardians and Peter uh, abilities, but uh, Peter's also can unlock uh, different perks uh, throughout the game. So as you go through the journey and you explore a bit, you can find component parts all over the place. And when you have enough and you, you find a workbench uh, in an environment or when you're back in the Milano, because uh, they have one, you can go there and, and craft like different uh, uh, perks for for the, the characters it can go to a uh, quicker reload like uh, uh, charge attacks or be able to slide on your back as you evade an enemy after he knock you on your back uh, stuff like that you can also have a, a component localizer so when you have that perk uh, it can tell you in the rough location where there are those components that you can find to to upgrade the different perks like you're you're, you're currently doing right now so um, the Consum uh, the consumable uh, magnet like allows you to uh, attract like the, the the HP points that enemies drop on the ground like you don't have to run towards them to grab them uh, they will come back to you if you have unlocked the, the, that perk so there are little things like that that uh, will add to uh, your 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 uh, skill set for Peter Quill that are optional you don't have to do these things but they will really bring something to the uh, the table depending on your playing style. Very nice. Yeah, it's it's. You know, there's good upgrades in there. It's it's. You can kind of gauge how much there is to do by how many things there are to unlock, and it's you know there's clearly plenty to keep you busy. Yeah, a sense of progression. 
All right, I'm being told we have to wrap things up. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. All right, so before we go, there's a couple things we want to show off. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, but Mondo is pressing the soundtrack on vinyl. Uh, keep an eye out for details on that as it goes up. I'm sure you can find them on the Eidos Montreal Mondo various social media feeds. Um, but that is all the Star-Lord songs and the orchestral score. But that is not all. JF, you have something you want to show off. Uh, some sharp-eyed fans noticed in the, in the launch trailer that teenage Peter Quill is wearing a very sp specific set of sneakers. Yes, uh, we saw uh, when we did the, the launch trailer, uh, fans like picking up on the fact that young Star-Lord had the Forum 84 high top Adidas sneakers. And um, and that it, it's cool. We were happy to see that. And, uh, and it was great to see like uh, fans like being excited about those shoes. And uh, it started when we designed uh, young Star-Lord. Like we wanted it to, to feel and look like he's, he's a kid from the 80s. Uh, yes, he has long hair. Uh, he has like his uh, jean coat with cut off sleeves and then the patch of his favorite band in the back. And he also has those great uh, Adidas uh, sneakers. And uh, so we had that, that vision for the game and we brought it to Marvel. Marvel got excited with that. They discussed also with uh, Disney and they approach uh, Adidas and Adidas like really jump uh, into it like uh, in a very exciting way because like what they did is that not only they allowed us to use their, their sneakers, but we were allowed to brand them as Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. As you, ca you can see on his shoes on the side, he took a Sharpie and he created created the, or drew the, the logo of his favorite band, Star-Lord. And, and it's really cool. And it's all it started. I did just loved it. It's in the game, so it, it feels really uh, authentic. And it doesn't stop there because I did ask, like went a little bit further. And let me do this here. They, they, kinda, they kind of really recreated the uh, Forum 84 high top sneakers. And as you can see, it doesn't stop there. It's really young Star Lord sneakers that you see here. And I love that. Soon, Official Star Lord Adidas. Correct. And soon enough, fans will be able to put their hands on those beautiful sneakers. The Star Lord Forum 84 high top shoes from the game are becoming a reality in the upcoming months, and fans in select regions will have a chance to purchase these limited edition sneakers. Just head over to adidas.com and check out the Adidas Creators Club for more details and sign up information, which will give you the where, when, and how to get a pair for yourself. Well, that seems like a good stopping point. We are all out of things to show you without spoiling everything. A uh, huge thank you to Square Enix, Marvel Games, and Eidos Montreal. And most of all, JF, thank you so much for flying shotgun with me and showing me around this awesome universe you've created. Thank you. It's really appreciated. And stay tuned with uh, everything that is Eidos, Marvel, and Disney. We have more surprises down the road. Uh, so go to the social medias for the latest and uh, hope you enjoy the game. It's coming out now. Well, if you want to find out what happens next, you don't have to wait too long because Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy is out everywhere tomorrow on PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Xbox Series X, Series S, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, and PC. And for more on Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy and the ever-growing Marvel video game universe, stay tuned to IGN.com. Bring hell down from the